This is Ari Koretsky and welcome to Jews You Should Know, introducing the broader community to interesting and inspiring Jewish men and women making a difference in our world. Some are already famous, some not yet so, but each is a Jew you should know. We are here with David Siegelman, Moshe House founder and CEO. How are you, David? I'm good, thank you. Wonderful. So I, I would imagine many listeners to the podcast have, have heard of Moshe House before. It's become part of the pun, but maybe a household name over the last number of years in the Jewish world. Um, but of course, you didn't start Moshe House at the beginning of your life. So let's take it back a little bit and, and get a sense of where you're from and what your background was like. Sure. I was born in California. I grew up in the Bay Area. Uh, I grew up in Hayward, which is just south of, of Oakland. And, um, you know, in my city where I grew up, there weren't really, it wasn't really a large population of, of Jews, although there, there are in the Bay Area. But, but we spent every Sunday, my, my Jewish connections really started going every Sunday to San Francisco to spend that time with my grandparents, um, who are Holocaust survivors. And, and my dad was born in displaced persons camp in Germany. And I think that that really had, you know, sort of the, the biggest Jewish influence on me growing up. Um, and then were I grandpa- were your grandparents very forthcoming about their experiences. Uh, my grandma did not talk about it or discuss it and she didn't like it when my grandfather did, but he did talk about it. Wow. And they were in the camps or what was their experience? Yeah, they were in the camps. Um, she was from Ludge. She was from Warsaw. Um, they were both in the camps for about five years. Wow. And then they met in a displaced persons camp after, after the, the war in Germany. It's incredible because Polish Jewry really w- was the most decimated, as we know. So it sounds like they were really among the, the absolute exceptions. Yeah, my, my grandfather, um, he, he lost everyone. He was actually married. Uh, before the war and and lost everyone and so there's not none of his family survived my grandma actually had a sister survive and then over a decade later the two sisters found a third sister in, in israel so oh my that, goodness yeah that was really special so they actually three of the sisters survived i mean there are more and parents and things like that but of the of their family they had three that's incredible did they re- reconnect that branch of the family once they met up yeah absolutely and 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 then Two of the sisters were in Israel and one, my grandma was in San Francisco. And just a couple of years ago when I went and visited, I spent some time with that side of the family and they actually had the, um, they still had the yellow star from, uh, from my, I guess my great aunt, uh, my, my grandma's sister from, from the war. So that was pretty, you know, wow. intense. that's incredible. So it sounds like they, they were your really the most formative uh, influences on you from a Jewish perspective early on. Yeah, because we didn't have a particularly religious household. And I then went on to, I went to Catholic high school. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, but interestingly, my Catholic high school had a lot more Jewish students than my elementary school or middle school that were public. So go figure. Uh, yeah, go figure. That's how I guess it works in the Bay Area. So obviously at some point, it sounds like you strengthened your own Jewish identity or you became clearly much more engaged. How did that happen for you? Uh, there are a few things. I think that, that to name them, one was definitely a teen trip to Israel. Sure. Um, since I was going to Catholic high school, my parents wanted me to have a Jewish experience. And so they sent me um, in 1997 when I was uh, 15 years old. I turned 16 actually in Mount Masada. And it was 80 other kids turn, going from sophomore to junior in high school. And it was amazing. Which program I, was it? It was, a, it was a federation teen trip. Okay. You know, it was before Birthright had started, and, and it was the first time that I was just surrounded by other young Jews, and it felt like, wow, this is a real connection for me. So, so that, and, and I also um, got involved in BBYO in high school, and that really helped, I think, a lot with some leadership skills and, and development as well. Yeah, absolutely. Those uh, teen trips to Israel, I know, have been described as one of the, you know, the most impactful in terms of, you know, longitudinally on Jewish identity, sounds like that really happened for you. Um, did you get to go back soon after that? Or how did you build on that? Yeah, not soon after, but I did, I did make me think, okay, I want to go to a college that has Jewish community. And so I ended up going, they were building a new building, a new Hillel at UC Santa Barbara. And I went down there and I just, I really 
um, fell in love with a school and uh, that's what they call it. you can study buzzed right UCSB yeah exactly <laughs> exactly I mean it was just a great I mean for me I never went to, to summer camp growing up but for me that was my summer camp oh it's, I've been it's beautiful I mean I, I don't I really don't understand how anyone studies there at all it's, it's gorgeous no, and I really didn't know other places were different. I actually remember I did a program in college where I came out to University of Maryland because oh, really? there was a pro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know, I know. And so um, the program was in D.C., but they housed us at, at Maryland, and and there was a Shabbat dinner, and I had no idea even what like kashrut was. I was just blown away that there were so many that that that, that Orthodox people existed, and that, that, <laughs> you know, it was it was wild. It was wild. And there's no I, no I, beach at Maryland. No, 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 no. They do no. have something they call La Plata Beach, which is like on North Campus by where the freshmen live. But it's basically a big piece of green artificial turf and a little sand for some sand volleyball. There's no ocean. There's no waves. There's uh, no surfing. So, Santa Barbara is a, is a real slice of heaven. And so, incredible. So uh, the, Jewish, the Jewish life there was strong? Yeah, it actually has the largest number of Jewish students amongst the UC system. And, really? and they were building this new building. So for me, it was a an exciting opportunity and I went down there and I wanted to get, you know, involved Jewishly. So I, um, I did participate in, in Hillel and um, eventually I started working uh, at the Hillel at the front desk and then teaching at, at the religious school. We'll see Santa Barbara doesn't have, let's say a huge um, a flock of Jewishly educated teachers. So you basically, if you could read a page ahead of a fourth grader, you could, you could teach and, and so I, I did that and really in, in, enjoyed it. And so all of that really led me to, um, to two important things. One was um, I really got to know some of the communal leaders within Santa Barbara, people who were sitting on the boards of the Hillel and the Federation and things. Right. And, and towards the end of my sophomore year, uh, I got a call from my parents that my dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Aye, aye. And it was just, um, you know, it was numbing. And, and even going off to college was a real stretch. It was the first in my family, either side, to have gone from high school to, to college, um, to, you know, a four-year university. And, and so I was going to have to, and I had actually just planning on studying abroad, actually, at the University of Tel Aviv and going to backpack in Europe that summer. And, yeah. and so really everything changed. And, I, and there was a Hebrew Free Loan Association in Santa Barbara that I applied for a $2,000 loan so I could finish my uh, sophomore year since that financially it wasn't going to work to stay in school. And I did my interview and then they, um, you know, they, they called back and they said, look, we didn't approve the, the loan, but we are going to do a, uh, we're going to do it as rent. And rather than repaying it, what we'd love is for you to continue sort of being involved in Jewish student life and working at the synagogue. And they said that they would continue it for my junior and senior year. That's so, incredible. So you went in for a $2,000 loan and you came out with a much larger grant. It was a full tuition for the rest of the year. And then I just worked, I worked about, you know, 40 hours a week with all these different things to, um, to pay for my rent and my food and books and things like that. And so to me, that was transformative for, for so many reasons, but, but Jewishly, it, it made me realize, like, whatever this thing is, it's something that I want to be a part of. Like, That's an incredible for, story. For people um, to take that kind of leap. Yeah. How did your dad's um, illness progress, and was that something that was a, a major theme over the next portion of your college career? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was really tough because he was, at that point, diagnosed with, and given three months to live, and so... Um, you know, I was home for the summer and trying to do projects. I mean, it was a pretty rough summer. My friends were all <laughs> traveling Europe. Right. And, uh, I was trying to help. I remember he was trying to get a few projects done around the house for my mom. And so one of them was putting in a sprinkler system. And I remember having to dig the ditches to run the sprinkler line. And he wasn't in, in shape, but he was an engineer. And so he sort of told me what to do. And oh, it was yeah. just awful. I mean, I worked all day. I had a job, and then I'd come home and dig these ditches to run the sprinkler system in the in the backyard. And and it did turn out to be a slower growth tumor and originally diagnosed. Um, so he did he did live for for uh, several more years, and he, he passed away actually after I graduated from mm. from college. But we did have more time. With him. Well, I guess a silver lining there. But so it sounds like you you were really drawn into the the community. You know, it's interesting because 
on the one hand, you know, I, I think of the, you know, the Jewish idea that if we take a step and kind of doors open in front of us, the way we want to go, we're often led. And so it sounds like you took those initial steps, but then you were given as a result, this incredible opportunity that further drew you in um, and, and gave you access to all of these different experiences and, and kind of threw you into the, you know, the deep end of the pool there, working for all these different organizations throughout college. Um, did you know at that point that, hey, I want to dedicate my professional life to working in the Jewish community? Like, when did that light bulb go off for you? Yeah, not at all. Not at all. I studied business and economics. I had an internship with a company. Actually, it was the, I sent my, when I was teaching sixth grade, one of the homework assignments I gave was to find me a paid internship. And, <laughs> and one of the kids, dad said, you know, come on, come on board. And so I started working for his company when I was in college and had a great time. I, I, uh, I had a paid internship that turned into a job afterwards, which was great. I also wanted to stay in Santa Barbara, but I, I was doing the, the Jewish stuff as a additional volunteer meaning work. And, you know, what, what sort of changed was I met, met a guy, Morris Squire, and he was 80 years old and he came to Hillel and he said he was there because all the old people are at the synagogue. And so he wanted to be around the young people like him. <laughs> and his wife was 26. So I guess, oh, I guess there was some truth <laughs> for that. And we, um, you know, struck up a relationship where, uh, he would basically, it's a, it's a longer story, but, but once a week I'd go to his house and share ideas with him. And most of the time he said no to my ideas. And sometimes he said yes and would fund them. And so we ran all sorts of programs in Santa Barbara. He was able to do philanthropy without having to work with the community because he didn't want to work with the community. You know, that was my job. And once we started doing more and more products and they started growing and it started becoming time consuming, I did that my junior and senior year of college and then a couple years after and and the projects you know he, he started saying yes to enough things that i quit my job and started doing that work full time and that's that's where moisha house was birthed out of um, so i'm guessing moisha is is morris's hebrew name exactly exactly that's wild. So, so this guy sounds like a real character what was his background and his story was he a full-time philanthropist like <laughs> He owned psychiatric hospitals that he had sold called Forest Health Systems okay. in Chicago. And so the foundation was the Forest Foundation that he had. And he was an artist. He was a thinker. He was a psychologist. But most of all, he was just out there. I mean, <laughs> he, he, he also fancied himself as an inventor. I remember he, um, he, he, he liked chocolate-covered fruit. But he thought, you know what? You know what I like more than fruit? I like meat. Oh, goodness. So he got someone from the um, culinary school in Santa Barbara. He hired her, and they worked on different chocolate-covered meats. And then I remember at, at, at Rosh Hashanah, he was handing them out at the synagogue to the kids, little chocolates, and they were eating them. But it was chocolate-covered pork. <laughs> and so he was asked to stop. And I remember he said, you know, he swore off the synagogue. He said, they've kicked me out of shul. How can you kick a Jew out of shul on Rosh Hashanah? And, you know, all they did was ask him to stop uh, handing out a chocolate-covered pour. That's, that's a great story. And I mean, you know, I guess that's a creative idea. It doesn't sound very appetizing, but I guess it's like, you know, dinner and dessert all in one bite. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's great. That's great. So, but it sounds like you obviously, you know, captured his imagination in some way. I'm curious, you know, what were some of, what were some of the other ideas you brought to him well, the biggest thing we did that was bigger than Moisha House in the beginning was we had this theory that there was a captive audience of college students who were going to go off to be high earners. Right. And this was a time where we could actually get a high earner for low wages. And we saw a lot of um, my friends were, you know, going to be lawyers and doctors and all sorts of things, business people. And but they were working for about eight dollars an hour you know in the av room or the coffee shop or whatever and it was you know basically pizza and beer money and so we thought okay we have a captive audience here what if we could pay them more so we paid them ten dollars an hour and we said rather than a job that's not leading you to where you want to go in your future you submit to us what your job description is and the two things that have to exist is that it has to benefit the community and it has to benefit skills and a direction you want to go in. 
And we got these amazing applications from people who started after school programs for kids. We started something called, or took over something called the Schmooze Room at the Jewish Federation on Wednesdays, um, cooking dinner and doing entertainment for the senior citizens at, at the Federation, fundraisers for orphanages in Kiev. I mean, all sorts of things. We probably had 75 people working. Wow. Um, and then every week there were two meetings. One meeting was around the success of the work and the projects. And the other meeting was professional development. So we had people come in and teach, okay, how to tips on leading um, big group meetings, small group meetings, public speaking, memory, um, enhance, throwing your you know, memory skills, um, uh, interview skills, all sorts of things. So that was an amazing program. I loved it. I, it grew, but it couldn't really scale that much beyond Santa Barbara, but it was, it was really a That's really program. cool. Has, has anything, have you kept up with any of those people or have any of them gone on to anything more remarkable publicly? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm good friends with, with most of the people in the program. That's awesome. So it sounds like at some point someone came up, one of you guys came up with this Moshe house idea or model. Was that you're kind of just sitting around drinking a beer and, and just going to hit you or what was the genesis of that? The genesis was I went up to the Bay area to visit my family. And while I was there, I went and had dinner with some friends who had actually been on that team trip to Israel back in 1997. This was like, almost nine years later. And I went over to their house and, and we were just eating. They rented a four bedroom house in Oakland. There's nothing Jewish about the house because they rented a house and they weren't you know, saving up all their money to buy Judaica for the <laughs> And we all were in the same place that we were less Jewishly involved than we had been because we were too old for Jewish life on campus um, and too young for even what they were defining as young adult programming. It was like 30s and 40s mainly. And we were in our early 20s. And so we thought, well, let's do a let's do a um, a reunion Shabbat dinner. And I know Morris could pay for the main course, and then we'll all do sides. And so they already had the house, they had the couches, they had the kitchen, and we sent out text messages and emails to our friends and that had been on that team trip. And seventy three people showed up for wow. um, this Shabbat dinner, and it was just so nice. It was just so nice, and it was easy, and it was laid back, and it was Jewish, and and that was the end of it. I mean, I felt like, okay, mission accomplished. But the next week I got an email um, from someone I'm still good friends with who said they, that he went to this Shabbat dinner. He had three friends. They had all gone to Jewish summer camp together. And they wanted to create something similar in San Francisco. So talk to Morris. And then all of a sudden there are these two houses, one in Oakland and one in San Francisco. And his email to me was really the outline for Mush House. So you just, you just kind of went to Morris and said, hey, we've got these Shabbat dinners going, kind of organic. Can you, you know, pay for it? You know, maybe some, some meat and, and chocolate and that's it. Yeah. And then we worked out the rent. They needed a bigger place. We knew we didn't want to pay them, but we wanted them to have the resources to do it. So, so the model evolved over the next year and he fully funded it for the first two and a half years. Well, and so did you know right away that you were kind of onto something that this was like a scalable model that this was, Hey, let's get houses all over the, the world. Not to the scale that it's at now, but definitely I thought that there could be a dozen of them. I right. mean, we, we started getting emails pretty soon thereafter from different cities, from young Jews saying, hey, I want to do this. And everything that I was experiencing were, room, were boardrooms with no young people in it saying, why don't young people do any? And here I am getting emails from all these young people saying, all we want to do is do something. Right. So you were able to turn to the communities and say, look, you know, they actually want to do something. We have to empower them with the right things to do. Yeah, and we had the financial resources to sort of be a real R&D shop. Right. So what, what were some of the early lessons and, and kind of how did it develop from there? Yeah, lots of lessons. I mean, some are that even good change is hard for people to do. I mean, change is tough. So, so when we'd say, okay, here's this new policy rule, like for, for the new people who would join on, they'd say, okay, great, no problem. That's, that's a rule. And then for someone who hadn't been operating that way, even if it was beneficial to them, it was like, no. I liked it the old way. And that was a big thing. Another learning was not to try to figure things out in a vacuum. So the first, that first Shabbat dinner, they mailed me the receipts. And my only job was to take them from my mailbox. On Mondays, Morris's accountant or bookkeeper would come over. So all I needed to do was hand her the receipts. And, and somehow I managed to lose them in the process of my mailbox to, to his house. And so I thought, okay, well, we need a better system here. So what we'll do is we'll buy them scanners. 
And so I let them know we're going to get them scanners. And they're like, what's wrong with you? We, we have cameras on our phone or digital <laughs> cameras. Why wouldn't we just take a picture and email it to you? What are we going to do with a giant scanner? And I was like, okay, yeah, this is, this is right. Craig. We have to turn it over to them to figure out what, what's going to help and, and be the right methodology. So, you know, there are lots of learnings like that along the way. Yeah. Now, obviously, it's, at some point, you must have realized more that you were really onto something or something was developing. I would imagine fairly soon you maybe outgrew Mars's either capacity or willingness to be, you know, the, the sole, uh, you know, funder. And, and it sounds like you were getting requests from all over. How did it develop from there into something that became more of an actual organization? Yeah, that was a, a traumatic uh, growth experience. I'll say that. You know, life was good. I didn't understand why anyone ran an organization where someone just didn't pay for everything. It was such an easier way to live. But there were real challenges with it. And in um, July 2008, the program went from being fully funded as part of his foundation. He was putting in, at that point, a million dollars a year. And, and how many houses was that supporting? About 20. Okay. And we had staff. And when the market changed and started plummeting, uh, he immediately shut down his foundation. Altogether? So, altogether. There was no money going out. And so wow. we went from fully funded, housed in his foundation to zero funding and nowhere to go. And so that was tough. It was, what do we tell the residents? They're affecting our rent subsidy. Um, what do we do? I mean, we didn't have anything. We didn't have um, a bank account. We didn't have a mailbox. We didn't have letterhead. So that was a huge challenge. And the good thing is that we were young enough that we didn't know what we didn't know. And so we thought, okay, well, let's figure this out. So, and who's you know, the we at this point? Well, we had um, two other people who were the regional directors. So they were managing the house. And then I was like running the program, okay. like the organization. So I just reached out to some of the uh, people who I'd met along the way and let them know what was happening. And I was blown away like that they wanted to help. And so we raised about $40,000 um, pretty quickly from friends, which would last get us another month. So we say, went that's from, about a month if I'm doing the math. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we went from two weeks to being shut down to six weeks. And that took about a week. So we we're like five weeks now. So that felt good. And really, our strategy was not going to be to the organization going. It was going to be to shut down more gracefully. And so we talked actually with the Schusterman Foundation about this. And, you know, they're miracle workers. I mean, they came in and they said they gave a grant for six months worth of expenses to because that's how much we needed to shut down more gracefully. And they said, you can either shut down more gracefully, but we really like this program. So, you know, if you can raise other money, do that. And, uh, but we'll understand if you, if you shut down. And so they did that. And then we just went out and tried to raise other money. I remember the first letter I said, I just tried to send letters. I didn't know anything about fundraising. So I just wrote letters to people who I thought uh, had enough money to give away. And I remember I got a call from one who said, look, I never opened this kind of stuff, but it was uh, like handwritten on the envelope. Um, Cause we didn't have like, you know, supplies and stuff like that. And he said, you have no letterhead. You have a Yahoo email. And it sounds like a good idea. And so, you know, I reach out and, and, and that person actually, that foundation and that version of what is the Righteous Person Foundation, they gave us a grant and also helped us learn how to do some grant writing and, oh, that's and that kind of stuff. Taught and you how to fish, stuff. yeah. Yeah, and so we survived. We actually grew that year. That's incredible. That's really incredible. And can just, just before proceeding with that, can you just explain a little bit about what the Moishi House model is. How does it work? I mean, it sounds like there's some rent subsidy involved. What are kind of the expressed goals, the, the regulate, just like, you know, a, a dummy's guide to, uh, to what the model is. Yeah, the core model for Moishi House is, is really focused on post-college, pre-family Jewish life, 22 to 30 years old. And we want that to be the most exciting, vibrant part of one's Jewish journey and experience. And so the model works where three to five young adults um, they rent a home, just like young adults do. And in addition to the home being where they eat and sleep, they also put on programs, one or two programs a week. And there's four program categories, social, Jewish culture and holiday, Jewish learning, and repair the world. And in exchange for running these programs for their, for young adults, you know, the average 
you know, several hundred people a year coming to Moisha, each Moisha house. Um, we do a rent subsidy uh, and a program budget. And then they furnish the house and they do all those other pieces. And they're turning their home into a place for hundreds of young Jewish adults to come have Jewish life. And so now there's 108 Moisha houses in 27 countries. Oh my goodness, 27 countries. That's really incredible. What are some of the more unexpected countries where, where you have a Moisha house? Yeah, China, there's two. Auckland, New Zealand. And then some of these places where, you know, you surprise Jewish life exists for young adults. Um, Bulgaria and Prague and, and Budapest. And then all throughout the former Soviet Union, there's two houses in Germany. So yeah, it's really all over. It really sounds like, like a, uh, an organic student-driven or, or young adult-driven Chabad house kind of you know, model. Although the students or the participants are not, obviously not Chabad emissaries, uh, but try to kind of create a beachhead on all different kinds of locations. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good analogy. And, and the other difference is that people live in Moesha House for one to three years. And so it keeps the uh, people running the programs in their 20s, because peer to peer for us is very important. Right. How do you vet who's going to be populating these houses? I mean, is there an interviewing process? And do they have to have a certain requisite amount of Jewish knowledge or creativity or what's the qualifications? Yeah, there's a, there's definitely a full application process. It looks different for a new house than an existing house. So a new house, um, you know, the, they, there's individual applications and then group applications and then interviews and all of those things. And we're looking for, you know, a well-rounded group. And then for an existing house, when it's um, someone who moves out, usually there's someone who's been involved in the community who's excited and ready to move in. And so there's same application, but usually it's um, a little more uh, quick and, and smooth. And then for every 10 houses, there's someone whose full-time job it is to oversee those houses. Okay. And they, so they, they're like a Jewish professional who's kind of consulting with them exactly. on programming and that kind of stuff? Exactly. Doing site visits and all those things. So we have staff now in, in Prague and in, in uh, Madrid and in Kiev, all throughout the North America and things like that, because they're really supporting the houses in their regions. Super cool. And I would imagine our, that there would be a lot of shared resources or pooling of ideas. I mean, are there like forums or conferences or online you know, venues where people kind of exchange ideas or do you post resources or graphics and things like that for people that they can just download? I mean, have you tried to create turnkey solutions for people or are you trying to keep it as decentralized as possible to foster more local creativity? Uh, we, we do want to foster the local creativity, but we do think being part of a global Jewish community is important and, you know, best practices matter. So we do, we do all those forums and pieces and then we have training conferences. We do one called, it's called NaddyCon National Conference. It's in Detroit this year. Uh, and then we do InterNaddyCon. That's in London for the international residents. And then we have, um, we call internally BabushCon. Uh, the, the Russian speaking <laughs> one. Uh, and that'll be, um, I think in Moldova this year. And in addition to that, we have about a hundred learning retreats as well, where we're teaching a lot of um, three day experiences on Jewish learning programs and things like that. You know, in that regard, how do you sort of ensure, or do you ensure kind of a, a quality control in terms of the Jewish standards, in terms of the Jewish experience or the Jewish learning aspect of it? Is it just as simple as if they're doing it and they're Jewish, that's sort of self-defined? Or do you try at least to institute a certain level of academic intellectual rigor or, or just a certain standard of quality? Well, the first I think is to be really transparent to say that it matters to us before they move in. And actually, I think it starts at the staff and goes all the way in. So even for our own staff, we have a program where um, all the staff are funded to find a teacher and learn between once a week and once a month. So I, wow. and, and, and those teachers are paid. So we have, you know, $72 an hour can pay. Um, so I, I, I learn every week. I mean, I'm not Jewishly literate and I've been learning for four years now um, every week. And, and the rest of the staff is, is doing it as well. And so I think that that's really interesting, especially since, um, I think for this population, Jewish learning has been defaulted into two categories, either in preparation for a bar, bat mitzvah or something like that, or to become religious. And that's why you Jewishly learn. Those are the, and, 
you know, there's kind of no other reason. And, and I think we're trying to debunk that and say, actually, if you want to be a Jewish leader, Jewish learning matters. And there's a lot of teachings that, that we can um, absorb from our teachers to become stronger ourselves. So that's been really exciting. And then, and then we've invested in Jewish educators. So we have three Jewish educators on staff, plus three more roaming Jewish educators that are, you know, less hours. Um, in the regions. And the houses have particular budgets to be able to hire Jewish educators to do series and stuff like that if they don't have the sort of background and skill set themselves. And these, these educators um, that are in-house are just kind of resources for them to tap into or to, they can bring them as speakers? What's their... Not really bring them as speakers. They really work with the houses to, to develop their Jewish ed programs. And then they help them find local Jewish educators to partner up with. And then we're running Jewish learning retreats. You know, like I said, about 100 of them a year. Uh, how to create pia- Passover in your home, Sukkot, Shabbat, all these different, Jewish mindfulness and meditation, all these different things. What would you say is some of the most creative programs that you've encountered along your travels through these 27 countries and, and all these much houses? <laughs> well, I remember I showed up after a, a long flight at Moisha House in London. And I went downstairs and it was a program for Darfurian refugees. And my experience here was, you know, Darfur programs involved non-Darfurians, you know, sort of marching or, you know, something like that, like free Darfur. There, I got to the house and it was like 50% Darfurian refugees at the Moisha house. And the program was that they did a drop-in on Sundays and the Darfurian refugees in London would come to the house they would cook together with the um, you know, Jewish people and, and switch off between Jewish foods and Darfurian foods. This was Darfurian Food Week. And then there was a sock wrestling tournament. So so- sock wrestling, did you say? Sock, sock wrestling. <laughs> and so I found myself on a Sunday afternoon eating Darfurian food in a sock wrestling tournament where you put on like a, like a football, like a soccer sock, you know, knee-high sock, right. and you sit back-to-back with someone, and then they say go, and you're on a rug, and you can't stand up, and whoever is able to pull off the sock from the other person first goes on to the next round. And, like, it was just so fun. And for the Darfurian refugees, a lot of them, their family was still, they had kids or parents and things like that still in Darfur. And they just felt like it was so nice to be able to sort of have a little bit of an escape and, and culture and program and activity and stuff like that. And it was, it was awesome. It was really it was really fun. And so that, yeah, that the other, another one that, that I loved was in San Francisco, uh, there was a guy in law school and he thought, you know, I really like to spend, I'd like to see a prison. And so he called San Quentin prison, which, you know, is a, a, a you know, maximum security yeah. prison in the Bay area. And, um, they said they don't do tours, but he found out through some research, the only way to get into San Quentin without, you know, murdering someone. <laughs> right is to um, have a softball team and you can play their softball team. San Francisco Giants and Metallica sponsor their team. Um, They have a beautiful field in the yard, in the prison. And if you're on good behavior for three years, you can try out for the team and it's a real privilege. And they play on Fridays and Sundays. So we put together a team, we were called the Matzah Ball Stars. (laughs) And we went and spent a full Sunday in the yard in San Quentin um, playing inmates in softball. Man, it was a it was a trip. How do the Jews do against the uh, these rough and tough inmates? <laughs> you know, some of them have played a lot of you know, college sports and things like that. You know, they could hit the ball a lot further. Uh, I'll say okay. that. But uh, we did okay. We played. We ended up playing um, basically three games, and uh, we lost two and one one. But they were good. They were all good. they were all they were all good games, and. Um, it was it was a whole different world. I'll bet. Oh my goodness. Do you end up traveling around personally a lot to visit these places or you really leave that to these regional managers? Really it's the regional managers, but I do it as much as I can. I mean, I've I've really I'm incredibly lucky that, you know, I think about that summer that I didn't get to go backpack Europe and how much I've made up for it in uh in the travel to seeing the Moisha houses and the Moisha house residents and conferences and things like that. Yeah. What to what degree do you, does Moisha House collaborate with other organizations uh, that are out there? Is it constitutionally 
designed to just be independent so it really maintains that peer-to-peer flavor? Or is there encouragement to kind of branch out and, and connect with more established organizations? Um, 20% of the programs have to be in partnership with other organizations. Interesting. And, and the biggest indicator for success, we really invest a lot in evaluation. The biggest indicator of success is are people getting involved in Jewish life outside of Moisha House that they are discovering through Moisha House. So that matters a lot. And, but we do want the freedom for the residents in the house to be figuring out those partnerships. I mean, we have some national partnerships, but really they're building that out. Right. That's incredible. I guess just starting to wrap up, David, what now at this point of your growth, you know, you talked about the challenges early on and that incredible challenge of organizationally defining challenge, it sounds like, of 2008. But now, you know, with explosive growth comes different new challenges. What are some of the the really signature difficulties uh, that you encounter at this point with such a large operation out there and, and so much going on? Yeah. And it's a different organization. I mean, I think staffing is tough. You know, we used to be a team. We used to sit in an office and, you you know, if you turned your chair around, you bumped into everyone else who worked there. And, and now we're, you know, over 50 people spread across multiple countries. So, you know, that's certainly something. And I think keeping up the, um, the sort of R&D and innovation. I mean, there's, there's, there's more programs and projects that we're excited to take on and, and how to sort of make sure that we're funding and putting enough energy towards proven programs that we need to grow and also saying, okay, but the, the, the world is changing. We have to change with it. And so how are we listening to people about what they want to be doing and directions they want to go in? So that's, that's something. And then obviously, you know, it's just a lot more fundraising. Yeah. I mean, the budget just is much larger. So all of those, all of those things exist today. And I imagine you have a development team at this point. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, we have regional people, uh, DAs, directors of advancements, and they're really out there working hard, particularly in the local communities. Wow. You said that you're looking constantly towards the future. I mean, what is the next chapter? What, you know, what do you feel is still missing in the landscape? Is it just a question of proliferating more houses, more countries? Uh, is it getting more people involved in programs? Is it something altogether different, like a whole other frontier that you say, oh, I want to go and, and tackle this in the, in the broader Jewish world within the space that you're occupying? It's definitely more of what we're doing. And um, an area we've invested heavily in the past year, we started something called the Open Door Project. And really, we are seeing a lot more Jewish programming, but Judaism and Jewish practice and Jewish spirituality not really growing in that same way. So we're providing a fellowship for cohorts of emerging spiritual leaders, um, clergy, to build and create Jewish practice and spirituality in ways that might look different than the traditional models. And I think that's, that's hugely important. And would you then uh, deploy those fellows to Moisha houses to offer? Not to Moisha houses. No, this is really to let three to five rabbis, clergy's dream and say, look, here's, here's what I'd want to be building in this city and, and giving them three years of funding to go do it. So it's really following their dreams. And, and if Moisha house people get involved in it, great, but it's really, um, it's meant beyond that. And another piece, I think, is immersive experiences. Um, I think that they're just so, so important right now. I just got back this weekend. We did our second Camp Nine and Nine. We did Jewish summer camp for adults. And we had 226 people. It's 300 bucks. And we rented out a Jewish summer camp. And um, it's time of our lives. And uh, we're going to do one on the West Coast for the first time ever. And I think, well, I think we can grow to have thousands of people, 21 and over, going to Jewish summer camp as adults. I just, I just think these experiences, uh, immersive experiences are really where it's at. Summer camp with booze. It sounds, <laughs> sounds great. <laughs> yeah. I can't help but when you talk about the open door project you mentioned a minute ago, I can't help but hear the parallels between that and between what Morris and you did all those years ago, telling students, you know, Hey, come and dream. And, and I think that's really, a, seems like the, the theme, the overarching theme of, of your model in general for spreading Jewish identity seems to be empowering people in the field to dream, to build, to create, yeah. which is really, I think, a unique 
approach rather than sort of the top-down model that many people might be accustomed to. Just in closing, David, you mentioned before the idea of learning weekly, which is incredible. I think an, an awesome benefit that you offer the staff. How has this whole journey impacted your own Jewish identity over the years? Wow. I mean, it's, I think it's just solidified it. I mean, I think it's just, it's just connected the, the dots between the family I know and the family I was passed away hundreds of years before I was even born and saying, we have something really special here. It really adds to making a meaningful, important life. And what a sort of honor and pleasure to be a part of growing that for myself, my family, others. Beautiful. David Siegelman, founder and CEO of Moshe House, a now massive operation all over the world. And we wish you continued success to continue growing that operation, both quantitatively and qualitatively. Thank you so much for joining us, David. Thank you. This has been Ari Koretsky on Jews You Should Know. Please visit us at JewsYouShouldKnow.com and subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume podcasts. Find us on social media at Jews You Should Know. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Jews You Should Know. Finally, If you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review so that we can continue to grow and introduce many more people to Jews you should know.